so uh, let's let's get to the issues here. Uh, first of all, uh, you uh, wrote an article today saying that you're very encouraged by how things have developed in financial reform. Uh, you know, I'm 50-50 with you. So tell me why you're encouraged first. Well, uh, you know, I also said in the article that, that this is just the beginning of a long road. But what's, what's happened is that since the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, filed suit against Goldman, and the whole Goldman story dominated the media for about a week, ordinary people started figuring out what was going on. And what was going on was Goldman's business plan is you create junk so that your hedge fund clients can bet against it, and then you sell it to ordinary folks as if it was good stuff. And, you know, people started getting it. And what happened was Wall Street became kind of radioactive. So you had Republicans starting to vote for reform. This this Republican wall against any kind of reform started breaking down because even the Republicans don't want to seem like they're shells for Wall Street. And as a result, you know, you had a bunch of amendments that were not given any chance of passage that made it into the bill. Uh, Al Franken uh, comes out of nowhere with an amendment that, that cleans up credit rating agencies, and there's a much tougher amendment now on derivatives. So this is not going to be uh, over with this legislation. It took Roosevelt seven years to put some constraints on Wall Street, but public opinion is starting to turn, and as you were saying regarding the demonstrations against the banks, what is also really a pleasure to see is that the Tea Parties are no longer monopolizing public indignation. Progressives are starting to articulate protest, and it's about time. You know, you made a good point about uh, why the Republicans seem a little spooked at this point. Because you're right, I mean, I was surprised that uh, t about 10 of them joined Franken's amendment, which was very positive. Bernie Sanders' amendment passes 96 to nothing to audit the Fed, kind of, but largely. I'll take it and, and run. Uh, okay. and, and that has to do with Bob Bennett. So tell us why Bob Bennett plays into this equation. Well, Bob Bennett is a you know traditional conservative Republican senator from Utah. Uh, in 08, when uh, then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, Bush's Treasury Secretary, comes before Congress and said the world is coming to an end unless we bail out the big banks with no conditions, no questions asked, with the so-called TARP legislation, Bennett votes for TARP. And so uh, in the nominating convention, they really whacked him with that. Uh, Wall Street's not real popular in Utah. And he came in uh, third, so he doesn't even get a place on the ballot. So it's very interesting. I mean, here's Bernie Sanders, the most lefty member of the Senate. Uh, this bill was originally not given a snowball's chance. And then they realized he had the votes, and they persuaded him to tone it down a little bit uh, so that it was a one-time audit. Uh, and it audited what I think is the really important thing to audit, and, and that is who the Fed is bailing out. I mean, the Fed's conduct of monetary policy, that should not be politicized. But when the Fed is bailing out this one and not that one, and uh, you don't know what the terms are, that needs to be audited. 98 zip. Uh, really impressive. And it tells you that the tide is starting to turn. What was disappointing was that you didn't really see the president lead very much. And on a couple of these things, uh, Geithner, his Treasury Secretary, was on the wrong side. So we got a long way to go, but it's moving in the right direction. All right. So, and we're talking to Robert Kuttner. He's co-founder, co-editor of American Prospect, and his new book is A Presidency in Peril. Um, Robert, did, let's talk about the downside. Okay. So now, as things are going forward, uh, we also take a couple steps back. Uh, it turns out that that major uh, derivatives reform has a giant loophole in it, uh, which is that oh, by the way, you don't actually have to report your swaps, and if you don't, there's actually no penalty. And in fact, the people who get to decide whether you should or shouldn't. Uh, is this group called a Futures Commission's Merchant, and they are run by the largest banks. So, well, there goes derivatives reform. And then number, well, and number two, uh, Dorgan wants to put an amendment in there. I'm not sure how it's doing uh, this week. We're going to find out. That says, hey, you know what? No naked credit default swaps. These are the right. side bets. And it, we're not sure it's even going to get a hearing. Well, uh there's a big fight over, over which amendments come to the floor, and you've got to kick and scream the way Franken did to get your amendment uh, taken up. So, yeah, as I said, this is, uh, this is not the, uh, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing Churchill, uh, this is not the, the, the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning. 
and uh, we're making a little bit of headway here. And just something on the derivatives. Um, the important thing about uh, the the uh, provision that Blanche Lincoln got into the bill is that it basically says, look, if you want to play this derivatives game, you play it with your own money. You don't play it with uh, taxpayer-guaranteed deposits. You don't get to be a bank that has FDIC insurance and also get to trade in derivatives. So even though there are a few loopholes in it, the idea that this puts the taxpayer at risk, that's that's gone, assuming that this passes. So, you know, I'd give it a B plus. I think it's pretty good, but it's so much better than where we were two weeks ago. That's what's a little bit encouraging. And I, I say this as someone who has written a blisteringly critical book about how Obama has been much too much in the pocket of Wall Street. And again, the leadership here is coming from people like Dorgan and Franken and Lincoln and uh, progressive members of Congress. Um, Obama, uh, to the extent that Geithner speaks for him on the wrong side part of the time, he's got a guy named Gary Gensler who's seen the light. He's the chief commod- uh, you know, the chief derivatives regulator. So the administration's a little bit split on this. Um, but it's moving in the right direction, and it damn well better, because if it doesn't, the Tea Parties are going to articulate all the economic anxiety. The whole country's going to move to the right. And what should have been a Roosevelt moment for progressive reform will have been squandered, and the Democrats will just take it, take it in the chops this fall. So the stakes could not be higher. Before we get to the Deficit Commission, because I think that's very important, you also wrote about that, uh, there's a shell game being played there. One, one last note of pessimism from me. Uh, I think that if we find out it, what the derivatives uh, bets actually are, and we say, all right, well, now you've got to put up the capital for those bets, uh, I think the entire banking system is going to collapse. So they're not going to allow that. And so that's why I'm ultimately pessimistic, because they don't have, they leveraged uh, up to the hilt. They're, it's all off book. It's on the naked credit default swaps. They're not, they don't actually have the money. So if we, if these legislation passes, it, that's real reform, I think the th- whole thing caves in on itself because it's going to at any point. It's just a matter of when it gets revealed. So that's why I don't think the powers that be are going to allow that to happen. Well, I think it's going to be a very close vote. Uh, but what's interesting uh, in terms of what you just said, you know, 30 years ago, how did banks make money? People deposited savings, and they got X amount of interest, and then the banks looked around for who was a reliable credit risk, and they charged Y amount of interest on the loan, and the, the, the profit that went into the banker's pocket was the difference between X and Y. And the system was never put at risk, and bankers were careful about who they lent who they lent money to. Then along come the wise guys, and they decide they all want to be like hedge funds. They all they all want to be like gamblers. But you know, if we can get the banking system back to what it was 30 years ago, it was almost like a public utility. They, they used to joke there was the three six three rule. You know, you you pay savers three uh, percent, you lend out the money at six percent, you're on the golf course by three. Um, we need a drastic simplification of the banking system so that if you want to gamble, go to Las Vegas, but don't gamble with taxpayers' money. And if you do that, the banking system will serve the rest of the economy, and bankers will make a decent living. They won't make an exorbitant living. So I think it's possible to have a banking system that, that is viable, that it serves the rest of the economy, that, that doesn't play these gambling games. I, I think it's definitely possible. My only issue is I think it's going to happen after the current banking system collapses. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how that turns out. Well, the current banking system's already collapsed, and it's only propped up thanks to the Fed and the taxpayer. That's exactly and right, that, that's and that's the problem. So dis- <laughs> that's what's so disgraceful about the way the administration played it, that back in uh, a year ago, when the whole banking system was dependent on the Feds, the government had the leverage to pass real reform. And the government said, nah, we'll do reform later. What, what, what we'll do now is we'll prop them up. And when they when they really had him, uh, you know, where they wanted him, that's when they should have insisted on reform. They would not have dared to send lobbyists down to Washington to try and uh, defeat it. Uh, I, I couldn't possibly agree more. So real quick, on the last issue, uh, this deficit commission, uh, they say, oh, don't worry, we've got to get the budget under control, and we will, and, th- and that should be priority number one. You know, I, I want to leave the priority in the jobs bill aside for a second because we have limited time. I want to talk about what the Deficit Commission might do and why you think it's so dangerous. Oh, my God. I mean, 
talk about putting the cart before the horse. You know, we don't have a recovery yet. We got 10% unemployment. We've got uh, 6 million homes uh, likely to go into foreclosure this year. And they're talking about balancing the budget. They're talking about cutting Social Security. They're talking about adding a value-added tax, taxing the middle class. I mean, it's almost like they want to commit political suicide as well as economic suicide. Get a recovery going first. Spend enough public money to put people back to work. And then you get the economy growing again. You get revenues coming in again. Balancing the budget won't be so difficult. If you send everybody to debtor's prison, you're going to balance the budget at a lower level of economic output, and and the whole thing is more arduous. So, it, you know, on the one hand, the administration's been captured by the bankers. On the other hand, it's been captured by the deficit hawks. A lot of them are the same people like Pete Peterson. And if, if they get whacked in November be, because we don't have a jobs of recovery, it's their own fault for embracing this kind of garbage. And, and the Republicans are going to, you know, uh, betray them on this, right? I mean, they're the going to say, oh, gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, raise taxes, cut Social Security, and then they're going to vote against it, right? Well, the Republicans are going to say, I mean, I could write the commercial. The Republicans are going to say, hey, the Democrats have a secret plan to cut your Social Security and raise your taxes. And the Republicans are not going to sign on to this anyway, but in the meantime, it has the effect of paralyzing the administration's ability to do what needs to be done, which is to spend more money on jobs. There you have it. Robert Kuttner, co-founder and uh, editor of the American Prospect and the author of A Presidency in Peril. Thank you so much for joining us. Great on to be with you.